He had a terrific big smile on his face. In fact, it was evident that joy emanated from him. He seemed to be overflowing with genuine happiness. I hadn't the slightest idea who he was, and I don't know his name now. The only thing I could guess about him, he's from Dixieland, for he had a down south accent. It all happened on a Fifth Avenue bus. He gave me a bone-crushing handshake, which almost made me wince. And then as he moved toward the door with the crowd to be let out of the bus, I couldn't help saying to him, where do you get all this uh, great spirit of happiness? Just as he passed out of the bus, he waved his hand to me, and he said, you know where I got it. And he added, I've discovered the amazing secret of happiness. Now, I wish I could have talked with him further, because he was extremely attractive as a man and that he had found something, really found something that was extraordinary, was so evident. Only for a minute did he touch my life. I probably never see him again, and I don't know him, but the encounter was unforgettable. There are so many gloomy people all around us everywhere in a great big city like this, so many irritated people that it's a great pleasure to find one like that occasionally who's absolutely happy and who's perfectly delighted to tell you the source of his happiness. Now, a sermon ought to be preached on happiness in every Christian church once in a while because Christianity is a happy religion. Now, I know that its principal figure is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he himself said, These things have I spoken unto you that your joy might be full. In the book of Proverbs, you will read that he that hath a merry heart hath a continual feast. And you'll also read that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine whereby a gloomy spirit drieth up the bones. I often wondered what that meant, drieth up the bones probably meant he had arthritis. <laughs> I don't know whether a merry spirit is a cure for arthritis or not, but I do know that a deep, inner, effervescing happiness can throw off the gloom thoughts that cause much sickness in the world. And in the scripture lesson that was read to us this morning, it said, the disciples were full of joy. Now, you're the disciples. So am I. So are the ministers on the pulpit. So is the choir and the choir loft. We are all disciples. Are we full of joy? Well, the thing that's made Christianity reach the world wasn't its gloominess, wasn't its sadness, wasn't its negativism, it was its happiness. It moved over the ancient world like a bright and happy spirit. And wherever Christians have been joyful, it has been so that they've recruited new disciples 
in large numbers. The church in this country ought to really get happy. And if they know what their religion's all about, you're bound to get happy. Now, the secret, the amazing secret of happiness. Have you got it? Really? If not, how does one get the amazing, this amazing secret of happiness? Well, one thing is to do happiness-producing things. All you have to do is to do the things that produce happiness rather than the things that produce gloom. And you're in. You have the secret. Do fun things. I suppose you've never heard that from the pulpit before. Do fun things. You don't want to go through life tense and tied up and nervous and scowling and miserable just because you read the newspapers and listen to television. Maybe if we didn't have those things, we would all be happy because we wouldn't know a lot of things to be unhappy about. But since we know all these things, it's the end thing to be unhappy, apparently. So do the things that produce happiness results. As for example, it doesn't, it doesn't amount to much, but my wife and I, the other day, I had a speaking engagement in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we took an Air Canada plane from New York and they went to Winnipeg. And uh, in Winnipeg, they had to lay over an hour and a quarter on account of it being customs or whatever. So they told us there was an hour and a quarter layover, and there we were in Winnipeg. Well, now every airport in the world is the same old kind of a place. You walk into the airport expecting something new, but you don't find it's the same old airport. <laughs> some are better than others, some are worse than others, but the same general thing. So I said, I, I don't want to sit around this airport. And she said she didn't either. So we walked outside the airport. And there we came upon the vast Canadian prairies. Winnipeg's before they begin to rise up into the mountains. You get them at about Calgary. But Winnipeg is way out west on the prairies. And there's something about the prairie that grips you. Our ancestors must have become great Americans because they crossed the great prairies slowly in wagon schooners. They had an enormous sky overhead and a great stretch of earth out in front of them. And uh, they knew vastness. So we came out of the airport and there was a road going over across the prairies. And my wife said to me, what do you say we, drive, we walk a mile up that road? I said, if you walk a mile up that road, you've got to walk a mile back. <laughs> she said, I'm surprised at your mathematical knowledge. <laughs> well, she says, we've got an hour and a quarter, and we can walk a mile in 20 minutes. That means we could walk two miles in 40 minutes. Oh, so, there we were. And we started down this road right across the prairies. Now, the airport's a long ways out of town. You're in the country. Walking along a road in Canada, out of Winnipeg. And I said to my wife, isn't this wonderful? Nobody can get you on the telephone. There's nobody here you have to dictate a letter to. There's nobody here you have to make an appointment with. There's nobody here that can ask you anything. Here you are, out on the prairies, and the wind is blowing. And she said, oh, I just got a hairdo. <laughs> I said, wrap a handkerchief around your head. And I said, what difference does it make about the hairdo? She said, you don't know what it cost me. <laughs> well, I said, isn't this great? We got about a mile away, and I said, I don't think we're going to get back in time for the plane. Oh, she said, don't let that worry you. If we don't get the plane, we're still in Winnipeg. Yeah? <laughs> well, I don't know what there is about all that, but it made me happy. It made me happy that I just didn't care if I went anywhere. 
and I just didn't care where I was. And there was nobody driving me, nobody telling me what to do, except my wife. And, that, <laughs> and that's par for the course anyway. Do some fun thing. Go out and walk among flowers if you can find any around here. If you can find a tree, stand and watch it grow because it's talking to you right now. If you can't do anything else, go and do some loving thing for somebody. Maybe that's the best way to have the great secret of happiness anyway, to love people, do them some good. I was in a certain city long, not long ago making a speech, and it was to a big audience of about 10,000 people. It was one of these positive thinking positive mental attitude, motivational rallies. And I was on there to make a speech with several other people. And I just couldn't get going at all. And the more I talked, the worse it got. And I couldn't understand why I was having such a tough time. You know, I want to tell you something, friend. Public speaking can give you a lot of pleasure, but it can give you a lot of misery. I'm talking about the speaker, not the audience. <laughs> We admit that about the audience. I'm talking about the speaker. And I just wasn't getting it over. And it was one of the poorest speeches I have ever made. And believe me, I've made plenty. So I went back to my hotel. And now it was uh, getting along towards time to go to bed. And I didn't want to see anybody, and I didn't see anybody. I went out the back door. And I went back to the motel, and I was really low and discouraged, and I was all alone. So I went into my hotel room and uh, hung up my jacket. Then I happened to see a piece of paper over on the bed, and it was a piece of the hotel stationery. And there was a handwritten note on it. So I picked it up and I read it, and it says, don't be discouraged. There is always tomorrow. <laughs> and I said to myself, who could have gotten into this room after that speech? Because I was the first one out. Nobody could have beat me down to the hotel. <laughs> and I said, anyway, how could anybody get access to this room? I had the only key. That's right. <laughs> I, I had the only key. So I finally gave up the riddle and I went to bed. And the next morning I saw the maids out in the hall. And there was one maid. She was a pretty husky lady. She was middle-aged. She was black. And she had the most beautiful smile on her face you ever did see. And she was chuckling. I said, to ma'am, uh, could I speak with you a minute? I said, uh, do you take care of my room? Well, she says, land sakes, which room are you in? <laughs> I said, I'm in room 340, whatever it was. She says, yes, sir, I take care of your room. Well, I said, the funny thing happened. Somebody left me a note in there last night. Well, now, she said, could that be possible? And I said, yes, there was a note in there. She says, what did the note say? And I told her what it said. And she said, well, did that apply to you? <laughs> I said, it certainly did. And then I said to her, how many rooms do you take care of here daily? She said, I do 15 rooms every day. And I just love it because I'm making a home away from home for lonely, tired, discouraged people. And when I finish up a room, she says, do you know what I do? I said, no, what do you do? She said, I stand there and I bless the room. Now, I don't know who's going to be in the room, but I just bless it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, I said, and once in a while, you write them a note. 
She said, now, sir, are you a Christian? I said, well, I, yes, I'm a Christian. Well, she said, then you know what it says in the Bible, don't you? I said, what's it say in the Bible? She says, never let the left hand know what the right hand did. <laughs> Now, that's all I'm going to say to you about it. But if that note applied to you, so does the truth apply to you. And I went away knowing that here was a woman in what you might call a humble job. Although since when is housekeeping a humble job? It's one of the greatest jobs known to man or women, I presume. She was making beds for people. She was making a room clean. She was making it neat. She was making it a home. And she loved the people she was serving. And she discovered the amazing secret of happiness. She was a disciple. And as a disciple, she was full of joy. Well, you may say, I'm not a maid in a hotel. No, but you have a home, or you work in an office, or somewhere where you're surrounded with people. I tell you, it's very simple, but the simple things are the great things. The amazing secret of happiness comes from doing happiness-producing things. And that's number one. And the second thing is, Think happiness thoughts. Now, there was once a professor at a New England university who was very popular all over this country with his writings. His name was William Lyon Phelps, Billy Phelps, they called him, and he was beloved by everybody who knew him. He was a very erudite, scholarly man, and I remember some of his statements. One of them was this, that he is the happiest person who thinks the happiest thought. What kind of thoughts you've been thinking? Worry thoughts? Well, now let me tell you, a worry thought will never make you happy. A resentment thought, you are mad at somebody because of something they did to you, and you keep thinking about it all the time, well, let me tell you something. A resentment thought will never make you happy. A fear thought, some terrible thing that may occur to you, some sickness, some disease, some trouble. Let me tell you something. A fear thought will never make you happy. But a thought of courage will. A thought of victory will. A thought of love will. So why do we think these misery-producing thoughts and thereby acquire misery when by thinking beautiful thoughts we acquire happiness? There was a doctor whom I used to know. His name was Schindler. He practiced in Milwaukee or nearby. And he wrote a book once on the subject, How to Live 365 Days a Year. And also, How to Live a Long Time. And he quoted Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare's probably one of the wisest men who ever lived in American letters. And Shakespeare says, a light heart will live long. A heavy heart won't make it. But a light heart. You know, that word is very descriptive. A light heart. A heart in which or on which the troubles of life rest lightly. And Stevenson said, sit loosely in the saddle of life. And if you do, you'll live long in the saddle of life. Well, Dr. Schindler, quoting these men, said that 50 percent 
of the people who came to him as patients need not have come had they been happy people. And he said, if a person will practice Christianity and derive from it its great essence of happiness, he will very likely live a long and healthy life. And says Dr. Schindler, he doesn't try to cure by drugs or by medicine alone. He said, if I can bring a patient just for 10 minutes every day into the area of pure joy, I can make him well. Now, well, that means that you can think a lot of gloomy thoughts, but if you just for 10 minutes every day come into the area of pure thought, joyful thought, you will be made well. Now, uh, it seems to me that this ought to be the message of the church. But you know, I had a letter from a theological student the other day. And he must be a very sober sides kind of a guy. I can just see him. I would be mistaken in him, no doubt, if I did see him face to face. But he sounded so sad. And uh, how the world is going to the dog and how much pain and difficulty there is everywhere. And the reason he was writing to me was, now, I never had a letter like this before, so it really interested me. He said he wanted to emulate my career. So I got to thinking, why does he want to emulate my career? Did I ever talk like that? The way he's talking in the letter. So I wrote him back after a while, and I said, Dear Bill, or whatever, thank you for wanting to emulate my, in quotes, career. I said, I think I better straighten you out in the first place. Ministers of the gospel don't have careers. So I have no career. Careers are left for movie actors and actresses. They have careers. Politicians have careers. They're the only ones that have careers. Businessmen don't have careers. Scientists don't have careers. Careers are only for the stage and the screen and a political arena. But I said a minister, he, he doesn't have a career. All he has is an opportunity to witness for Jesus Christ. So I said, get the career idea out of your mind. But I said, if you want to do what you're talking about, I'll tell you how to do it. First place, you fall in love with Jesus Christ. You love him like nobody's business. You just go for him 100%. And if you don't go for him 100%, you haven't got any business being a minister of the gospel. And then in the second place, I said, you've got to get over that sober sides business and be joyful. There is no joy in your letter, which must mean there's no joy in you. And you're never going to be what you ought to be till you get some joy in there. And I said, you must be not a negative thinker. Your letter is full of negativisms, and you haven't got any business being a negative thinker. You've got to be a positive thinker. And I don't see any positiveness in that letter. And then I said the final way in which you do it is to work. And the second thing is to work. And the third thing is to work. And the fourth thing is to work some more. Meaning, work your head off joyfully. I haven't got an answer to my letter yet. <laughs> You see, if you're going to be a happy person in the Lord, you've got to pay the price of it. And the price of it is absolute, thoroughgoing commitment and devotion 
to God. So therefore, do happiness-producing things. Think happiness-producing thoughts. And you'll be like the disciples of old, joyful, always. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that the religion that you gave to us isn't based on sadness, gloom, defeat, or negativism. Although it is so vast in its thought processes that it deals with every circumstance in human existence and does so realistically. But thank you that you've given us a faith that is akin with the babbling of brooks and the songs of skylarks and the beautiful sun-shot sky at dawning and the star-studded sky at evening time and the moon shining in silvery radiance over rippling water. You put us into a beautiful world, your children, and told us to be happy in the Lord who guides us throughout this life, always in love. Make these people, all of us, happy people. In Jesus Christ, the Lord of happiness, in whose name we offer this prayer. Amen. Ah!